<laughs> Normally it never works, but uh, today it seems to work. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the second uh, uh, Alexander von Humboldt lecture in, uh, in our series on uh, cultures of mobility. Um, I also, of course, uh, uh, want to welcome uh, Professor Vincent Kaufmann. Uh, we are very happy to have him here in this series. Uh, and also to have him uh, that early in the in the program. Um, one of the main objectives uh, of our program um, is to uh, reach beyond um, the idea that mobility is nothing else than the movement between places, uh, and to address uh, the much broader societal or cultural meaning of mobility. Uh, on the one hand, this means that uh, we have to uh, link movement with the social experience, social effects and so, uh, social reasons for mobility. On the other hand, it implies that we um, define mobility not so much as movement uh, in physical space, but also as movement in social space, as social change, as social transformation. Again, linked with all the social causes and effects, as well as the uh, social experience of it. Um, many scholars um, have even declared that as a kind of a new paradigmatic approach in social research in general. And not in the last place, Professor Vincent Kaufmann. He has played an important and leading role in this scientific movement. His professorship in the field of urban sociology and mobility analysis also puts him at the focus point for linking space to uh, the social. In this framework, uh, he coined the term motility, in which the sociology of uh, mobility comes to bear and in which uh, mobility emerges as a form of social capital. And of course, such a new way of thinking also calls for a number of questions. Sure, mobility uh, also has a social dimension, and we can look at it from a different angle, but what is the value added? Um, which either two unsolved problems can we solve uh, with this new perspective? And what is the potential and promise of rethinking mobility? And here I would uh, uh, stick to uh, posing the questions and leave the answers to Professor Vincent Kaufmann. So the floor is his. Yes, I hope it. Yes, it worked. Many thanks for for this uh, introduction. First, I would like to warmly thank the organizers uh, to give me the the, <coughs> the opportunity to present my my work today. It's a real pleasure to to be with uh, with you, definitely. Um, as you can hear. I have an accent of French sociologists <laughs> when I speak in English, uh, so I hope you will survive for an hour. <laughs> so, oh, I have to, yes, show my presentation is not far away. Yes, it is here. So, rethinking mobility. That's not very original for a title. Oh, next. So, I will. Uh, I have organized my presentation around three times. Uh, the main is the third one, but before the third one, uh, presentation of uh, research results, I I will uh, do a short introduction of on mobility turn. Um, and after after that, I, I would like to. Uh, 
to do an advocacy for empirical research on mobility turn because there is a sort of gap now between very sophisticated theories and uh, empirical research uh, which is still uh, dealing with a lot of old concepts. Uh, for the presentation of uh, research results, uh, I will mainly, uh, I have chosen to, to speak mainly about transportation, uh, or more precisely, uh, to speak uh, about the links between transportation systems and mobility and motility. So it's a choice we, we can speak. It's to be precise uh, on a, a certain direction uh, that I have done this, uh, this choice. So first, uh, first uh, thing, uh, the mobility turn. So uh, I will address uh, to you some, uh, some things you already know, but it's some, sometimes it's, it's good to, to remember uh, them. The conditions in which movement take, take place has changed and is, is still changing the world. A world uh, that is living what many social scientists call the mobility turn. <coughs> this mobility turn, uh, here you have a, a quotation of Uri, is at the heart of global change and has contributed to an incredible increase in flows of peoples and goods. This growth bring, uh, bring it various problems at the practical level. Oops. What's that? Atmospheric and sonic pollution, energy consumption. For example, for atm uh, atmospheric and noise pollution, here you have some, uh, some statistics. Uh, so you probably already know, but uh, I mean it's quite important to have that in mind. In terms of energy consumption, uh, transportation sector represents 26 uh, percent of the world energy consumption and 58 percent of the world petroleum consumption, which is not, which is a lot in fact. But we have also, of course, problem of congestion, as you can see here. Uh, a bit a strange photograph, but I mean, also problem of uh, more urban problem, a problem of urban segregation, social fragmentation, urban sprawl. Here, that's a uh, that's a view of. Uh, um, in Mauritania, the capital, um, Nouakchott, where one of my PhD students has worked on the urban sprawl. So it's a worldwide uh, problem, this question of urban sprawl. So um, there is a lot of problem linked to, to this increase of flows and the mobility of individuals, good and information uh, could be considered as one of the main organizing principles, uh, if not the organizing principles, of the content contemporary territorial transformation. So, if when we have say that, and uh, uh, so it has been identified at the theoretical level, but it's not really totally integrated into empirical research. And this is uh, the problematic area uh, which uh, I focus my, my research. Uh, it's very important to develop appropriate conceptual tools to tackle the mobility turn. The extent of uh, this turn is so important that movement, their why, the movements, the moves, their why, how, and the way they, sh they change landscape, territories, and societies can no longer fully understood with cl classical concepts of empirical social sciences. 
The broadening of transportation options in particular has indeed introduced new realms of choices at the center of everyday life. Choices in terms of residential location, utilization of transport means, communication systems, amenity, urban amenities, and so on. Technical and social innovations in transport and communication systems are constantly changing the access and competencies that enable us to mobility. In fact, individual and social groups must continually and imperatively adapt to these changes. In such a context, the old behavioral models are no longer valid. I will give you an example. The, this small sentence is, shorter the better. Is it still correct? Uh, I remember you that um, transport modeling is largely based on this assumption. Travel time has classically been considered as a dead time between activities, uh, a dead time that people try to minimize. Uh, and uh, planning is largely ba based on this assumption. But it is uh, less and less true. I give you some results of you have a into bracket the, the references if you are interested in the old references of course I can give you the uh, the complete reference uh, since the end of the 90s daily travel time budgets have increased in the Europe and the US between uh, 40 years before it was quite stable but now it, it increase. Uh, it is the case uh, in Germany, in France, in Belgium, in Switzerland. I don't know about the Netherlands. I haven't seen the, the statistics, but it's a, a sign that people don't use uh, the transport system to minimize their travel time. Most people don't use the speed potential of transportation systems to shorten their travel time, but to increase their distance. That's, a, that's another uh, general, uh, general uh, result we, uh, we can see in uh, a lot of researches in transportation behavior. And uh, uh, the minimization of commute times is no longer the primary rationale for individuals' choice of transportation. Many people, and it's, it's the case in fact uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands as far as I know, uh, a lot of people go to work by train, even if it takes more time just because they can work on train. So. Uh, it shows also that um, travel time is not a dead time. It depends on the conditions of this travel time. Another example, the emergence of weekly commuting. People who live in another uh, city or even another country where they work and they go back for, for weekend uh, with with such new practices or with, with such practice, uh, we see that the, diff the frontier between daily mobility and residential mobility is not so, <laughs> so evident. And uh, again, if you uh, try to minimize your travel times, you don't do such <laughs> big uh, commuting or uh, or weekly commuting. So, uh, the old behavioral models are no longer valid, but the problem is that they are still used to plan land use and uh, transport systems. 
here you have that uh, peri-urban or outer, outer suburb commune in, uh, in France. Um, such conception uh, produce uh, such <laughs> territories. People don't use speed of transportation to shorten their travel time, but to live outside cities. And in a lot of countries, there is no, not really an answer to this, uh, to this uh, urbanization forms because uh, um, of this conception of uh, mobility and transport, which is not uh, probably so uh, so correct. Uh, related to, to the, the behavior of people. In fact, uh, we need more empirical research on this uh, thematics because uh, the broadening of transportation options uh, has introduced a, world, a wide range of choices and it's clear that people have, be very <coughs> have become very creative with them as you can see here. The bikers in a plane. For me, the main challenge facing mobility research consists to developing tools that are capable to describing and analyzing mobility choices. My work uh, consists in developing such tools uh, and uh, it leads to three different types of activities, theoretical conceptualization, empirical research and application. It's probably the originality of our approach in uh, Ecole Polytechnique de Lausanne. We try to link these three types of investigations uh, because we think it's a fruitful way to do research in, uh, on mobilities uh, in the perspective of, of social sciences. To do not only brilliant conceptualization and then conference worldwide, but also to do uh, empirical research on case studies and even more <laughs> uh, application uh, in terms of uh, implementation of, uh, of new uh, technologies or new, uh, new systems. Um, remember, I work in a, a school of engineers, so it's, uh, it's quite... Uh, I, I think it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a, when, you, when you, as a social scientist, when you work in a school of engineers, um, it is a very nice opportunity to go beyond what we classically do in terms of research in social sciences, to participate to, uh, to applications. So I, I arrive uh, in the main part of uh, the, my presentation, uh, the research results. Uh, I would like to, to present you some uh, some uh, some research we have done in Lazio last five years on, mo on mobility and, and motility, uh, and uh, these uh, these researches shows have shown a sort of paradox, uh, a paradox of the mobility turn. In fact, uh, a strong increase of moving without being mobile. Huh? Or you can say he's playing with words, but uh, we will define this, uh, these terms. Uh, here you have the cover of uh, a book uh, published last year, uh, which presents uh, uh, a synthesis of this research. Before presenting uh, these results, I will uh, shortly present the conceptualization, the conceptualization of motility and mobility, because uh, all the the old research we we have made on uh, on uh, on mobility is based on this uh, 
conceptualization. So, uh, to start with motility, I would say that the classical conception of mobility uh, takes for us two problematic shortcuts. The first one is uh, that mobility, uh, mobility means moving, of course, mobility means moving. But mobility is also a potentiality to move. And in a lot of research, especially in economic research, in the field of transportation and mobility, uh, mobility is simply a synonym for, for move. And this dimen dimension of potential is very uh, abs uh, absent. And uh, when uh, the potential of moving is uh, integrated, it, it is generally to speak about access, but uh, there is not only access in the uh, mobility potential of uh, people or more generally actors, there is also competencies and of course projects. You can have access to a lot <laughs> of means of transportation and communication if you don't have projects to, <laughs> to use it in a way. Uh, it doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't have any any sense for you. So that's the first uh, shortcut which seems to us a bit problematic. The second one is that mobility classically in a lot of research especially in geography I would say uh, or in classical geography uh, mobility refers to uh, to space or more precisely to to the crossing of space. But uh, mobility means also change. If you go back, uh, I <laughs> now I have my, ca my casket of all sociologists. <laughs> if we go back to, for example, uh, the book of Sorokin's, uh, Sorokin, Social Mobility, 1927. Uh, uh, in this book, that's the first time uh, we speak about social mobility in the literature, I, I think. Um, Sorokin tried to, uh, to define mobility, social and spatial mobility. And uh, in the, the discussion, he, he developed the idea that Mobility means crossing of space and change. Uh, and uh, so what, what, what does it mean, mobility as change? Uh, for him, uh, it means that uh, people are mobile when they change their role, where they change of state, where th when they change of position. Uh, and so uh, Sorokin is linking uh, mobility to activities and to time. Because uh, when we speak about change, it implies time in short term or long term. Sorokin is probably the father of uh, the research on social intern social mobility uh, which is a very classical field of sociology uh, now uh, it is a transmission what what is called social mobility in classical sociology is a transmission of the social status between father and sons classically and uh, this is the idea of change. I mean, the problem with sociology is that the, this discipline has forget the special <laughs> dimension of mobility. You know, that's that's another tradition. But what is uh, what seems to me to be very interesting is to to remember. 
for, for us uh, in the field of transportation. That's to remember that mobility has also a meaning link to change. And that's what we try to do with our conceptualization of mobility. The, bas the basic idea of our conception is that uh, each person of, or actor is characterized or could be characterized by an aptitude for movement. That it's what we call motility, and you have here. It's we have all all of us an ability to move. We have access to car. It, it is defined in terms of access to means of transportation and communication, but it's also, it also implies competencies. So, of course, the driving license, but some, some other competencies which are more uh, complex, like the capacity to organize in time and space our activities. That's clearly a competence uh, linked to uh, to motility and, uh, and the project. Uh, if we uh, the the nature of our projects uh, is uh, part of our aptitude uh, to move or our motility, this motility becomes movement. You can see here or move, move or movement. I, it's not easy to translate, in fact, because I, as you can imagine, the original <laughs> conceptualization is in French, and uh, in French, uh, movement or move is déplacement. And so it's another word which displacement that doesn't fit exactly. That's not exactly the same meaning. So, but motility uh, uh, becomes move and remains partially in a latent state. That, that's very important. I mean, uh, we, our aptitude of uh, our potential of. Uh, of move or aptitude for movement uh, is not totally transformed into movements of type of movement you do. Is it a movement with a, a strong change or is it a movement without really a change of activity or a change of, of role or a change of status or position? Um, to give an example, if you go from home to work, you have a change of activity. Uh, so you use your ability to move, your motility to go to work, so you do a move, and this move can be uh, characterized in terms of mobility, uh, and we can say that uh, there is a change of activity linked to the move, so it's, it's a mobility. But uh, when the movement or the move uh, doesn't imply a change of activity, we consider that as a weak mobility or something like this. It's, it's a movement, but without, I would say without mobility, but there is still the crossing of space. So it, and we can say that uh, every crossing of space implies a change because we, we cross space. But in another sense, if we do the same activity, at the origin and the destination of the movement, it's not a mobility uh, uh, as uh, in, in the same... Uh, 
uh, it's a mobility, but it's less a mobility than when it implies change of activity. So we propose, in fact, to define mobility in terms of change. So we, we go back to the old ideas of Sorokin and Co. And it opens an interesting idea for us, which is that it's possible to be mobile without moving. For example, with communication systems. If you are you are at work and your son calls you uh, because, uh, I don't know, he has a, a very good notation at school and he wants to tell you. So you are at your workplace, he's calling you and you do a sort of mobility because you change your role. You are not an employer anymore, but you are the father. <laughs> and then it, it takes, I don't know, five minutes, and then the phone call is finished and you go back to your work. But you have not changed, uh, you haven't moved in space. So, I mean, this conception with this, with, uh, with this conception of motility, movement, and mobility, you can you, you can work uh, on this idea that uh, it's possible to be mobile without crossing space. Uh, it's also possible, at the contrary, to cross space or to to move a lot without being very mobile, and that's that's the paradox we have identified in our empirical researches. So, I go, this idea of, mobili of motility, mobility, and uh, move, you, you have the, uh, the premise and the uh, discussion in this book, Rethinking Mobility. As you can see, I don't have a lot of imagination for titles. It's the same titles as my presentation of today, but anyway. So, uh, now if we go uh, through research results, I will propose to you to travel, to travel in research, uh, to play a bit with uh, these notions of motility, mobility, and movement. The first travel is, uh, have uh, named it uh, from highly mobile to disused urban railway area. We have made uh, uh, two researches to explore the rationales of the so-called highly mobile person and uh, their habitat. Over the past decades, we have uh, constat uh, an explosion of long distance commuting uh, daily or weekly in a lot of countries in, in Europe. Uh, it has uh, considerable envir environmental and social consequences. Here you have um, the statistics for Switzerland. Long distance commuting, uh, so it's more than... Uh, so a, a distance between home and work of more than... Uh, uh, 100 kilometers uh, represents 5% of the trip uh, to go to work. But it also represents 25% of the kilometers. So we can say 5%, it's, it's not a lot, but if we <laughs> look at the at, at the kilometers, it's, it's of course uh, a lot. Weekly commuting 
uh, weekly commuting uh, produces another problem. It drains the housing market in big cities. It is, for example, the case in Paris or in London or in Brussels, where a, a lot of people have a pied-à-terre in the city centre, and so students or uh, persons who live uh, uh, single uh, and who have not a lot of uh, money uh, don't uh, cannot anymore uh, find uh, small flats in city centres because the market is uh, growing. So. Uh, the long distance uh, daily commuting and the weekly commuting uh, causes us certain problems, as you can see. But we know, uh, we know, uh, li little is known about about the, the rationale behind these choices. So we, we have made a, a comprehensive qualitative research in Switzerland, France, Belgium, and Germany on this thematic based on the concept of motility to understand why people choose to be long distance commuter or weekly commuter. The uh, main results of, uh, of this invest qualitative in investigation is that <laughs> daily uh, and weekly uh, long distance commuter are sedentary people. Uh, they, uh, they accept, such commuters will accept a job so long at, <coughs> as it doesn't mean a move, a move of home. So they use, in fact, the rapidity of transportation system to guarantee their, their sedentarity. So in fact, they move a lot every day or every week, but to be sedentary or to avoid to move, or to be mobile, in fact. If we go back to our uh, conceptualization of mobility, move, and motility. Uh, we have also seen that daily and weekly long distance commuter uh, is a typical behavior uh, for people who, have a, who live in a family with a dual career, where, where two, the two parents, or where, where there is children, and the two parents are, are working, uh, and uh, like to work, and uh, do in fact a, a professional career. This is also interesting to, uh, to see that uh, these choices to be daily or weekly commuter for the people uh, which are doing that uh, every day uh, is considered as the less ineffective solution in a world of constraints. Uh, they, they think it's, it's uh, of course, it's not very nice to, to spend two or three hours per day in transport, but from their point of view, it's the best solution they have, uh, they have found uh, for their daily life, considering uh, the constraints uh, in which they are embedded. Uh, in general, these people prefer to use trains because it's possible uh, to use uh, the time to work or to read the newspaper or, or to sleep. But a lot of uh, these commuters use car uh, because uh, large-scale accommodation near train stations are rare. It's especially the case in France and Switzerland. Now, 
I propose that we continue with the uh, densification of the disused railway urban areas. Based on the research, I have just present some results. Uh, we have made this, uh, this uh, research, uh, which has been financed by uh, CFF Real Estate. CFF is a train company in Switzerland. Uh, and the, the, the idea of this research uh, is finally to uh, to see uh, if it is possible and where uh, to propose alternative, uh, to propose a, a living place uh, near stations in a nice neighborhood for uh, these uh, long distance commuter and weekly commuters. So we have uh, uh, work on the potential hosts for these lifestyles, the lifestyle of long distance commuter or weekly commuter, uh, in 30 sets. You can see here on this map between Geneva and Saint Gall uh, 30 uh, urban, uh, urban. Um, this use uh, area near near station, and for uh, all of them, we have uh, investigated seven dimension dimensions: the density, the accessibility, the atmosphere, the built environment around, uh, the proximity and amenities in the neighborhood, the feasibility of uh, urban densification and the socio-demographic environment. Uh, this study has been made at two scales, the site and uh, the 500 meters per meter, you can see here for the city of Fribourg. So here you have some examples of the, this uh, dimension or analysis we, we have made. It's Oh, it's uh, all the all the these indicators are on the same site, which is uh, uh, Fribourg uh, Central Station. Feasibility. Uh, you have here the noise, pollution, and so on. And for each of these sites, we uh, are able at the end of the research. Uh, to uh, define a, a visage, here you have the 30 visage, uh, which uh, uh, shows where, uh, in fact, the opportunities of densification are concretely, and where we can effectively attract these uh, people, the long distance commuter or the weekly commuters. The idea behind this research is that it's probably utopic to, uh, uh, to change the behavior of these people, but we probably can change their transport mode to go to work by uh, proposing a housing solution near stations. So that's a, a first. That's the first travel uh, in research. Uh, I would like to to show today. So we start with the theory, and then classical research, and then we we try to go with architects. We we are we did this research with a, a staff of architects uh, to identify concretely. Um, place where uh, we can have an action on this uh, question of um, commuting. Second travel in, uh, in research uh, from typology of motility to public transport supply. 
Um, so we will start here with uh, the job, job Mob research. It's an European research project with three goals. Measuring motility, because motility, it's nice to say it's linked to access, competencies, and project, but when you have said that, you, you haven't said a lot of things. You have to measure it <laughs> to, to, to define dimensions and to, to, to measure. So measuring motility, linked motility to job mobility. Uh, so that's, I mean, um, this is a, probably a classical uh, problematic for sociology, uh, uh, job, job mobility, professional career, and uh, aptitudes to, to move uh, in space. So the link between motility and job mobility. And the third uh, goal is to link motility to transport systems and cont contexts. Uh, is motility different? Uh, in countries where we have a lot of, uh, I don't know, uh, public transport supply uh, or a lot of uh, freeways and, and so on, for example. So, uh, th in this uh, European uh, research program, uh, we did a, a big survey, as you can see here. And uh, we have built a typology of motility, uh, which is based on a principal component at an analysis, followed by a hierarchical cluster analysis. Uh, and here you have, if you, if you want, we can <laughs> have a look <laughs> at this, but. I don't think it's uh, it's time to it's just to to show you the different uh, uh, indicators. So we have in fact six types of motility, uh, which are here. So we have the weak motility, uh, weak revenue, limited automobile access. Uh, few mobility projects. We have a second type, motility limited by access to, uh, with people with a residential location limited, with limited automobile and public transportation accessibility, but they have a car at their disposal, but they don't have the freeway, if you want. <laughs> they, are, they are in a rural area, uh, not uh, uh, not very accessible. Motility limited by skills. People who have a functional relationship to daily mobility. Uh, they seek to simplify transit to the greatest possible extent. The primary logic of these individuals uh, is to consider comm commuting as uh, uh, dead time, in fact. So this third type is effectively a type where people say shorter is the better. Um, the next type, motility limited by the potency of routines, the primary logic uh, of these people is to avoid being confronted by the unknown in general, in terms of space or situation. They don't like to be in a situation uh, where they have uh, contact to alterity, in fact. The next, uh, uh, the next type, motility marked by residential sedentarity. Again, eh? we, <laughs> we go back to this type. Uh, residential, the people who have a residential location highly accessible both by car and public transportation. Uh, they are very attached to, uh, to their residential uh, location for diverse reasons. Attach attachment to a place, a home, a social networks, uh, and so on. And uh, as a result, they have a strong propensity for weekly or long-distance commuting. 
And the last type, maximum motility, uh, people uh, who have as primary logics uh, to maximize motility potential in order to obtain the widest possible range of choices in terms of transits. That's uh, open to all opportunities, in fact. So uh, it's interesting to, to, to see that these six different types uh, show that uh, certain people have more motility than others. It's quite evident if you, uh, if you compare the first type to the last one. So, of course, it is linked to social structure, uh, revenue, uh, level of education, uh, social network. But, but we see also in this typology that uh, we have individuals who have different kind of motility. And uh, it's almost impossible to say who has more or less of it. It's simply different. For example, motility marked by residential sedentarities, they have a certain type of motility. Uh, we can compare it to uh, motility limited by skills, but we cannot say if the second time, uh, the second type or the type motility marked by residential sedentarity has more or less uh, motility compared to, to the other one. So we have effectively different uh, types of motility uh, which uh, refers to uh, different kind of relationship to space and, and time and movement. If now we, so here you have the, 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 the two results I, I, I have, oh, unfortunately, yes, that's what I, I would like to, to show you now. You have also differences between countries. Here you see the four countries where we have uh, made the, the the survey, and you, you see that the different types are not equally uh, distributed. It's, uh, it's quite evident for the motility limited by competencies. You see that in France and in Spain you have more <laughs> of this type than in the other. So, in fact, we have uh, differences in motility between uh, the countries. And this result is uh, particularly important for us because it, it shows that people are marked by their context, not only in terms of movement, uh, for example, modal choice, destination, and so on, but also in terms of motility, so in terms of what underlies the movements, in terms of mobility potential. The Swiss don't have the same rationale in terms of travel choices as the Germans of the Spanish. So in fact, changing, changing travel behavior implies changing not only the transport infrastructure and services, but more generally, implies the whole context that supports it. And that's, I mean, it's, it's very important uh, as a result in a field of transportation dominated by economy and especially by some kind of modeling who implicitly considers that all people in every country have the same rationale in terms of uh, choice, choices of uh, mobility. I will finish this second uh, travel in research uh, by an application of this typology for RFF. Uh, RFF uh, that's uh, France Railway uh, Network, 
uh, organizer. Uh, and the uh, RFF uh, is now introducing the fixed interval train timetable in France, in the whole country. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, it's already uh, expo the, the, the trains are already uh, um, the exploitation of trains are already uh, uh, based on uh, on this uh, fixed interval train timetable since ages, but in France, uh, it's uh, it's not the case. It means that, for example, here you have uh, a train every 15 minutes, uh, every day, every time, etc. In France, it's not the case. You have uh, one train in. Uh, uh, 8 hour 15, uh, the next one in 10 uh, 30, and uh, it doesn't do the same stops and the same destination. And it's very, very, very complicated. So, uh, RFF uh, is uh, introducing this uh, new uh, uh, manner uh, or new timetables. And uh, they were uh, asking uh, themselves what kind of, uh, of impacts uh, will it have in terms of growth in the railway demand? What, what, what can we expect uh, in both and long, uh, in, in the short and long terms in terms of growth uh, in the railway demand? And, uh, and in terms of ability to move of the, of the population. As you remember, here the French population seems to be not very competent to use the networks. And in fact, it is the main result of this study made, we have made for RFF. In fact, if they are, if we have a, a strong part of the population in motility limited by competencies, it's, it's basically because uh, the, uh, it's very difficult to use uh, the, 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 the trains in a, in a daily basis because uh, of uh, the timetables, which are very, very difficult to understand. <laughs> so. Um, that's the main uh, results of, uh, of this uh, uh, applicated study we, we made for RFF. So we, we, we did an, an exercise of quantification of the effect on motility and then uh, into uh, the use of, uh, of the trains. And uh, the main effects in terms of motility is that uh, after uh, the introduction of the fixed interval train timetable in France, uh, five or ten years after, you will have more uh, residential sedentarity, so more of the type five in this uh, graph. So we, we go back again uh, on this paradox. Uh, when uh, the supply, the service are nice and good, people use them not to be <laughs> mobile, but to avoid moving in a certain uh, in a certain way. We have never been so much sedentary, but we move more and more. And I will stop here. I think I have already too much spoken. Thank you. Yes.